So everyone get your toolboxes ready. We're about to do an orthopedic surgery preview. I'm Mark Sowers. So more than any other surgery, orthopedics has a lot of construction ideas. So if you've ever helped somebody build a deck or build a house or anything like that, you're going to recognize a lot of the tools and a lot of the techniques that are used in orthopedic surgery. And with orthopedic surgery especially, you realize just how much surgery is more like duct tape and bubble gum. You're just sort of putting things together and holding them in place just long enough for the body to take over and do all the real repairs. Really, we're just kind of doing our basic best to hold things right where they should be in order to get the body to take over and make those real repairs. So let's take a look at some of the terms in orthopedic surgeries. Abduction versus adduction, they sound very similar, but they mean slightly different things. Abduction is you're pulling away from the center line of the body. Adduction is you're bringing things towards the center line of the body. So in this case, you're bringing your arms away from the body is abduction, and you're bringing your arms towards the body is adduction. The way I remember it is ad, A-D-D, is you're adding things together. So you're adding your arms to your body, that's adduction. When you move your foot up and down, that's dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Okay, so the plantar part of the foot is the bottom part of the foot. So if you're bending towards the bottom part of the foot, that's plantar flexion. And the dorsal, think of like a dorsal fin on a shark or a dolphin, something like that. That's on the top side. So the dorsal side of the foot or the dorsiflexion is when you're building your, bending your foot upward. There are several different types or categories of bones, if you will. There's flat bones, long bones, short bones. There's irregular bones and even sesamoid bones, which are sort of little round seed almost looking kind of things. Some examples of these, of course, the flat bones would be like any of the bones in your skull. Short bones, think, so, think of the carpal bones in your wrist or the tarsal bones in your foot. Those are kind of short bones. Long bones, obviously, your humerus, your femur, things like that in your arms and legs. Your irregular bones, a good example shown right here would be a vertebrae. Uh, that type of bone has all kinds of weird shapes and protrusions in it. And for a sesamoid bone, think of the patella, the kneecap, okay? It's sort of a, a rounded, sort of flattened slightly almost seed-shaped uh, bone, so that's a sesamoid bone. So with long bones, you have a couple of different sections. You have the long, skinny part of the bone here in the middle. That's the diaphysis. And then at the ends, you have these sort of knobby things. That's the epiphysis. So each knob is considered an epiphysis. And between the diaphysis and the epiphysis is a little epiphyseal plate, which is where the bone actually grows. And as you're growing, that's the point where the bone is getting longer and longer. In the middle of the bone, you have a cavity. That's the marrow cavity. That's where the blood marrow grows. And surrounding the bone, on the outside of the bone, you have a periosteum, a little tissue, a kind of a tough tissue that covers the bone itself and sort of protects the calcium of that bone. There's two types of tissue in bone. There's cortical bone, which is real hard, real dense bone. It's pretty much solid all the way through. And cancellous bone is more of a spongy bone. Now we say spongy bone not because it's soft, not that because you can squeeze it, but because it has a whole bunch of little holes in it. So it's these, these sol think of a real solid sponge. So a lot of holes in it, but you can't really squeeze it because it's still really hard. It's still bone, right? Okay, so cancellous bone sort of fills the interior of these bones and they're surrounded by the cortical bone, that harder, tougher bone on the outside. Compartment syndrome is a condition that can sometimes happen to muscles, especially if a bone near them breaks. That's the usual cause for compartment syndrome. There are other reasons, but that's the usual cause. And what happens is, you've heard of fascia, of course. We talked about fascia a lot. That's that real tough fibrous material. So that kind of surrounds a lot of different parts of muscle, and it kind of divides that muscle up into different compartments. Now, because that fascia is so tough, it doesn't expand and contract very well. So if you have a bone break or some other reason that you're going to get swelling inside of one of these compartments, what can happen is the swelling can be so great within that compartment, but it's sort of held in place by the fascia that's surrounding it. So it can't expand. So the pressure inside that compartment builds up and builds up and builds up so much that blood flow is actually cut off. Nerves that run through that area are cut off. That pressure gets so great and then you have to go in there and relieve that pressure. And that's what compartment syndrome is. It's pressure that builds up within one compartment of the muscle. 
Exsanguination. Here's a fun term that you're going to hear a lot, and it's actually kind of cool. So what exsanguination is, is it means, you know, now, for example, right now in my hand or in my finger, I have a lot of blood sort of flowing through there. Exsanguinating my finger would mean squeezing it so that all the blood, you're putting pressure all the way around it, so that all the blood is forced out of the finger. That's exsanguinating the finger. Okay, and we use something called Eshmark bandages. That's this blue sort of stretchy rubber bandage. You've seen these things. And you wrap it around the extremity of a finger or usually an arm or a leg, as you see here. And what you do is you start at one end, you slowly wrap it around, and you're pulling it tight and you're pulling it tight. And as you're doing that, you're squeezing the blood out of that extremity all the way down and back into the body so that there's no blood left. And the reason for this is because once you get all that blood squeezed out of that extremity, you're then going to put a tourniquet on there, and that's going to stop the blood from flowing back in. So when you remove the ash mark, okay, you remove that blue rubber bandage, no blood's going to flow back in. Now your arm is completely or almost completely without blood. Well, you see, that sounds like a bad idea, but actually it's okay for maybe an hour or so it's okay. That means that the doctor can get in there and do some surgery and it's almost completely bloodless. It's really amazing how much surgery they can do and almost no blood loss at all because you've taken all the blood and pushed it out of there. So there's no blood in that area. Now, after about an hour or so, you have to release the tourniquet and let the blood in. And then your, your arm is going to recover from that lack of blood for a little bit. And legs, you can go a little bit longer, maybe an hour and a half or two hours. Well, maybe that much. But the idea of exsanguination is pushing all the blood out of an extremity. A fracture table is this wild looking table. Instead of just the regular OR bed that you put the patient on, this thing has all these extensions that grab a hold of different parts of the body, the legs and things like that. And it's going to pull them in different directions so that it's actually good for you because otherwise you would be the one sitting there pulling on the leg, trying to hold it in the right position. But that gets tiring after a while. So you let the fracture table do that work for you. You put the boot on the foot and you can pull that leg and move it in different directions. When we're talking about fractures, there's two different main types of fractures. There's a simple fracture and a compound fracture. And the difference here doesn't really have much to do with the bone. It has to do with the skin. See, if the bone breaks, but it stays completely in the skin, if the skin is intact, that's considered a simple fracture. But if the bone breaks and it protrudes out of the skin and into the open air, that's considered a compound fracture. And that's going to be much more serious because now you're getting bacteria and stuff in there that can cause infection. So a green stick fracture is kind of a unique fracture. What happens is, let's say you come down real hard on your leg and the tibia, what will happen is it'll split down the middle rather than across. It'll split down the middle and it'll separate one side of that tibia will separate from the other. And then usually one half will start to break a little bit. So the break goes in about halfway and then it slides up and down the bone length as well is not all the way across. That's known as a green stick fracture. A comminuted fracture, that's a fracture where the bone breaks up into several different pieces. So here you see the picture, there's several chunks of this bone, they're sort of moved out of place. When you have multiple pieces of bone, that's a comminuted fracture. A stellate fracture, stellate means star or star-like. Okay, so we're usually talking about a flat bone, usually the skull or something similar. And if you get hit by a point and it sort of pushes in on that one point, it's going to cause a fracture to sort of spread out in all directions, kind of like a star, a star-shaped. That's a stellate fracture. So if the patient's knees are either bowed outward or pushed inward, we're talking about a genu verum or genu valgum, also known as varus knees or valgus knees. Now, in this case, the term genu, that means the knee. So we're talking about the knees here. And verum versus valgum determines whether or not you're talking about knees that bow outward versus knees that bow inward. So verum means outward and valgum means inward. And varus and valgus sort of follow that same pattern. You're just changing the M to an S in those words. So they both mean basically the same thing. So how do you remember the difference between verum and valgum? So here's how I do it. Think of a piece of gum, okay? If you take a piece of gum, valgum, okay? You take a piece of gum, you're putting it between your knees, it's going to cause your knees to stick together, 
Okay, that piece of chewing gum is going to cause those knees to stick together. So that's how I remember valgum. When I see the word gum or gus, you know, change the M to an S, you're going to have the knees sticking together. But if you drink a lot of rum, your knees are going to spread apart. Get it? Okay, so valgum is going to stick your knees together and rum, verum, is going to pull your knees apart. But knees aren't the only place that this can happen. It can also happen to the big toe. And in this case, we have the term hallux. Remember, genu means knees. Hallux means the big toe. So we have hallux valgus and we have hallux varus. Now let's see if you can figure out which one's which using the little idea that I gave you before. So on the left side, we have the big toe pushed together. Which one's that going to be? Well, that's going to be gum. Gum st makes things stick together. Now, in this case, we're using the S instead of the M. So, val gus, val gum, val gus is going to be sticking together. So, hallux verus, again, change the S for an M, verum, right? Remember, rum open things up. So, hallux verus is the big toe is pulled away from the other toes. Sometimes in joints, when the bones rub against each other, little pieces of those bones can break apart. And as the bones continue to rub against each other, kind of like pebbles in a stream, they sort of bounce along and they get rounded as they do because the sharp points get cut off and sort of rubbed off. Well, that same process happens in your joints as these little pieces of broken bones start to rub against each other and they're bounced around. They start to get rounded and these little pieces of bone, these little chunks of bone that get rounded off are called joint mice. And obviously they can cause some pain for the patient. So osteomalacia, now osteo refers to bone, malacia refers to a softening. So anytime you have a tissue that's softening, it's malacia, all right? So an osteomalacia is a very softening of the bone. Now, why would bone soften? Well, a lack of vitamin D is a common reason for bones to soften. And the reason for that is because vitamin D helps calcium bind together and bind and stick in that bone. And if you lose the vitamin D, you're going to lose some of the calcium in the bone and the bones are really going to soften. So a lack of vitamin D causes a condition known as osteomalacia, or in layman's terms, it's rickets, which is the condition of softening of bone due to a lack of vitamin D. A subluxation is a slight dislocation. So in this case, we're talking about the spine. And of course, all the vertebrae are usually lined up nice and neat and in a straight line. But every once in a while, you'll get one vertebrae that sort of slides out of position just a little bit compared to the rest of them. Now, we're not, not talking about, you know, a curvy spine like scoliosis. We're just talking about one vertebrae. It sort of slid out of position compared to the rest. The rest are in a nice straight line. That's a subluxation. And as you can imagine, you've got nerves and stuff running through those spaces. So if one of these vertebrae is out of position, it's going to be pinching on that nerve and causing a lot of pain. Rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see an example of sort of a late stage rheumatoid arthritis here. This is a condition where the body's immune system, this is an autoimmune disease, the body's own immune system starts attacking bones and joints. I know it's weird, but once you get the body to start attacking itself, in this case, the bones and the joints, well, that's going to cause a lot of inflammation. It's going to cause a lot of degradation of these bones and joints, and you get the deformities that you see here. That's rheumatoid arthritis can lead to this. So if a child has a broken hip or a broken bone near the hip, they'll often be placed in a spica cast. And this is a special kind of cast that's got a little rod running between the two legs that holds the legs apart and allows the bones to heal properly. So a spica cast is a special kind of cast that has that rod running between the two legs. So there's a lot of terms in orthopedics. Now let's look at a lot of the anatomy of orthopedics. When it comes to joints, that's where the bones come together. They come together at a joint, and there are three different main types of joints. There's a synarthrosis joint, a synarthrotic joint. That's a joint where the bones come together and they're almost fused into place. They don't really move at all. So think of the bones in the skull, where the frontal bone and the temporal bone come together. There's a joint there, but it doesn't move, okay? It doesn't really flex. It's just the bones are straight together. That's a synarthrosis or a synarthrotic joint. Then you have slightly movable joints. That's going to be 
amphiarthrosis. So think, for example, again, the vertebrae in your spine. They don't move very much. They bend a little bit between each vertebrae, but not a whole lot. Think of where the pelvic bones come together at the pubic symphysis. There's a little piece of cartilage in there that moves them a little bit, allows them to flex some, but they don't really move a whole lot. That's an amphiarthrosis or an amphiarthritic joint. And then diarthrosis, these are the joints you normally think of. Think of your shoulder, it moves around a lot, or your elbow moves around, your knees, your hips, they move around a whole lot. So those are diarthrotic joints. And then in the diarthrosis category, there are several different types of joints there. There's the ball and socket joint. Okay, you've got the ball sort of goes into the socket. Think of your hips or maybe your shoulders sort of the same way. You've got a hinge joint. Let's say the knee or the elbow. It doesn't move in a bunch of different directions, but it does move in one direction, more like a hinge. Then you've got a pivot joint. Think of the atlas and the axis bone of your neck sort of switches back and forth. You can pivot around that axis. Saddle joints, think of where your fingers come together. It's sort of a little saddle in there that moves your fingers, sort of slides back and forth. Ellipsoid or condyloid joints are where the bones sort of slide against each other in a little indentation. Think of, you know, the bones of the wrist. They sort of slide each against each other that way. And then gliding joints, think of your metatarsals or metacarpals that you have here in your fingers. And as you bend that finger, the two phalanges sort of glide against each other. And these two types of joints, condyloid and gliding, they are often interchanged depending on which book or which text you're reading. Now, condyloid joints and ball and socket joints are kind of similar. You have a little indentation. You've got another piece of bone that sort of fits into that indentation. If the indentation is kind of subtle like this, sort of an open curve, that's more of a condyloid or gliding joint. But if the indentation is real big, it really wraps around kind of a ball, a protrusion of the other bone, that's going to be a ball and socket joint. So as the bones come together, especially the diarthritic bones that move around a lot, obviously if you have bones moving against bone or bones moving against tendons and ligaments and skin and other things, you're going to get a lot of friction in there and friction can cause some damage and inflammation. So we have things called bursa, which are little sort of fluid filled sacs that help cushion the friction. So if two bones come together, they're not rubbing right against bone on bone. There's a little cushion in between those two bones and that's bursa or maybe surrounding the bone where the ligament or a tendon rubs over that bone as you bend it back and forth. That's going to be a bursa in there to sort of protect one from rubbing against the other, or even protecting the skin from rubbing over little protrusions of bone in some of these joints. So these bursts, of course, can get inflamed, and that's called bursitis. And if something even more serious than that happens, we can go in there and clean it out or repair it to bring that cushioning back as best we can. So let's take a look at some of the common surgeries that are done in orthopedic practices. A shoulder arthroscopy is a very common procedure and is done to help heal shoulder pain. A lot of times uh, patients will get pain in their shoulder as they're moving it around. Shoulder is actually kind of a complicated joint. There's lots going on in there and you can di get different things extending into different places where they don't belong and that can all cause pain. Now the entire shoulder, all the muscles and everything around it, that's known as the rotator cuff. So you've got all those muscles around that make up what's called the rotator cuff and that's all around the shoulder joint. And in a shoulder arthroscopy, what we're doing is we're doing just like a laparoscopy, we're doing little minimally invasive surgery, making little holes where we insert our scope and our instruments in. We're going to get in there and look around inside the joint on the big monitor on the wall and see what's going on in there. And sometimes it can be as minor as maybe one of the tendons is sort of frayed a little bit and you get these little pieces of tendon sort of ding dangling down a little bit. And what we do is we go in there and just sort of cut this little frayed tendon off because these things, think of them like hangnails, okay? You ever get a hangnail on your thumb or something like that? Of course, as you rub against it, it hurts and the more you rub, the more it hurts. Well, these little frayed tendons, the exact same thing is happening. So a lot of shoulder pain comes from these little frayed tendons that hang down, little pieces of tendon. And every time you bend your shoulder or something like that, it pulls on one of these and it hurts just like a hangnail hurts. So we're going to go in and cut those off and clean those up so that clean up that hangnail so that it doesn't hurt anymore. That's sort of a minor version of a shoulder arthritis. 
One of the important bones in the shoulder is the acromion process. Now this acromion process, a process again is an extension of another bone. So this is an extension of the scapula, the larger flat bone in the back. And it has this little extension comes off and it sort of wraps around in the shoulder. That's the acromion process. In the shoulder, you also have the clavicle that comes off the front. And the humerus, of course, is the arm bone that has the ball on it. And that's the one that moves up and down. So as you can imagine, you have the acromion process sort of sits right here over the shoulder. And then you have the arm bone, the humerus that moves up and down sometimes into it and past this acromion process. Well, as it does, it sort of grinds away or causes a little bit of irritation on the bottom of that acromion process. And this can actually cause bone spurs or a little bit of growth or some of that tendon fraying like I talked about earlier. So to give the shoulder a little more room to move in there, we're going to go in and do an acromion plasty, which means we're going to reshape that acromion process a little bit. And usually we're going to use a little burr and sort of scrape off the bottom part of that acromion process, give it, scrape that material away, giving a little bit more room in that joint for the bones to move around without rubbing against each other. As I mentioned, there are four muscles that make up the rotator cuff. Those are the supraspinatus, which is on the top part of the scapula in the back. The infraspinatus, which is the large bone across the back of the scapula. The teres minor down at the bottom of the scapula. And then on the front part of the scapula, you have the subscapularis. And all those muscles come together to reach up and grab a hold, their tendons grab a hold of the humerus and help to pull it in many different directions. And the combination of those four muscles which pull the arm in all these different directions, that's known as the rotator cuff. So sometimes what can happen in a bad injury, you can have the supraspinatus, which is again that upper part of muscle that runs right across the top ball of the humerus, right about here. Well, this the tendon can tear or break apart, at which point the muscle sort of pulls back. Now, if a tendon just frays a little bit or tears a little bit, usually you're just going to leave it in place and it can kind of sort of grow back eventually if you have a lot of patience. But if that tendon tears completely, well, the muscle is going to pull it way back here. And those two pieces of tendon are so far separated that they're never going to grow back together. So we're going to have to go in and pull them together, tie them together. And once again, they're together. We're sort of duct tape and bubble gum here. We're going to tie them together. And then eventually the body will start to heal that and bring those tendons back together in a more permanent fashion. So that's what we're doing in this image here. We're taking that supraspinatus, which is broken away from the humerus, and we're going to grab it and pull it back down over to the humerus and then tie it in to the humerus. We're going to do that by putting basically a couple little screws into the humerus with a little hook on them that we use the suture, tie it around, loop it through that tendon, loop it through these little hooks, tighten it up, and that pulls that muscle and that tendon back down to where it should be. Now, because shoulder surgeries are such a common surgery, it's likely you're going to see a lot of them. And when you get in there, it's really cool to watch, but sometimes it's hard to know exactly what you're seeing on the monitor up there. What is it you're looking at? Because everything's very close and you only see parts of things. You don't get a full view. You only see a little part of something. So... I really recommend, especially for this surgery, if you can find a video showing a shoulder arthroscopy and showing some of the landmarks, and oh, this is the supraspinatus, this is the acromion process, this is the top of the humerus, knowing these landmarks, because you're only going to see a little piece of each one through the camera, finding those is really going to help you out a whole lot when you're going into these surgeries. And then you can impress the doctor by saying, oh, that's the acromion process. And you know she'll be like, wow, yeah, good job. So more than any other surgery, this is the one I really recommend you watch a video or several videos of so you really see exactly what's going on in here. Now, if a shoulder becomes dislocated, that's where the humerus sort of pops out of the scapula. Sometimes you can just sort of go in and pull the arm in the right way and pop it back into place. You see this done a lot on TV. It's kind of a cool thing to do on TV. But sometimes when that dislocation happens, it could tear some of the cartilage around the scapula where the humerus head is going to fit in. And which means it's not going to fit in as tightly as it did before. It's going to be kind of loose, which means it's going to pop out again fairly often. And as that happens, we have to go in there and repair the cartilage so it's going to hold the humeral head in place a lot better. And here you can see a tear in that labrum, the cartilage that surrounds the humeral head. This is known as a Bankart lesion, where the labrum, the cartilage sort of tears away and makes the humerus very loose inside the shoulder. So a Bankart procedure is then going to go in and repair this tear so it's going to hold the shoulder in place. 
Now, if there's severe damage to the shoulder where you get to the point where you have bone rubbing on bone or just a lot of arthritis or other problems in there, you can do something called a total shoulder arthroplasty. Now, arthroplasty, arthro, we're talking about the joints. Plasty is we're reconstructing it and making it very different than it was before. So in this case, we're doing a total shoulder. We're taking that entire joint out and replacing it with artificial elements. We put a new surface on the scapula, and then we put a new ball on the head of the humerus so that these two new elements rub against each other nice and smooth and no more pain, and that's the theory. But one thing we notice as we're doing more and more of these surgeries is that it doesn't really matter which side is the ball and which side is the socket because they're going to move against each other this way or this way. So we can do a reverse total shoulder arthroscopy, in which case we put the ball on the scapula and then the smooth plate at the head of the humerus. A collie's fracture is a fracture of the wrist. And here's what happens. Usually this will happen is as you're falling, you sort of naturally put your hands out to catch yourself. And as you're coming down, you land real hard on the wrist. And as you do that, you can fracture the radius and sometimes the ulna in the wrist. This is known as a collie's fracture and is recognizable because sometimes the wrist is sort of pushed back, kind of like a shape of a fork. So it's got this funny little shape to it like a fork does. Now, to repair a collie's fracture, what we're often going to do is something called a closed reduction. Now, whenever we're talking about reduction, we're talking about reducing the gap or reducing the space between the two pieces of bone in order to bring them together and allow them to heal. Again, duct tape and bubble gum, bring them together as close as we can, hold them in place until the body takes over and heals that wound. And in this case, we call a closed reduction because we're not going to break the skin. We're all going to do it through the wrist by manipulating the wrist, bringing those bones together, getting them as close together as we can without opening the skin, without adding any you know germs or anything. So that's a good thing. And then we're going to put a cast over that and allow that to heal. That's a closed reduction. We're keeping the skin closed and we're reducing the gap between the two broken bones. So if we have a closed reduction, you can imagine we have an open reduction. Again, bringing the two bones together, that's the reduction. And then open means we're going to open the skin to do so. So in this case, I'm showing an open reduction internal fixation. So we're going to take some hardware, some plates and screws, and once we get the bone lined up, once we get it reduced, that gap reduced, we're going to put some plates across the bone. We're going to screw it into both sides of the bone. That's going to hold it into place. We're fixing it into place internally. We're doing it inside the skin. So an open reduction, we're opening the skin. Reduction, we're reducing the gap between the bones. We're putting the plates inside and fixing them inside. That's the internal part of the fixation. So just like with a closed reduction, there was an open reduction. So if we have an internal fixation, we can have an external fixation. And indeed we can. That's what it looks like here. In this case, we've taken some pins, sort of put them through the bone sideways, and then grabbed a hold of those pins as they're sticking out through the skin, bring them together and hold them in place. And that's externally fixing those bones in place. So that's an external fixation with a contraption like this. Now, just like with the shoulder where we replace the total shoulder joint, we can do the same thing with the hip and replace that entire joint with new artificial pieces. Now, with the hip, it's made up of two bones. We have the pelvic bone over here, and it's got a little groove in it. This is known, this little hole here is known as the acetabulum. So the acetabulum is a little socket inside of the pelvic bone that holds the hip together. And then on the femur, at the top of the femur, we have the femoral head, which is a little ball that sort of sticks out and fits into that little socket. So the hip is a ball and socket joint. And when the cartilage and other cushions in that joint break down, the one bone rubs against the other and can break up and really cause a lot of pain. So we can go in there and replace those with artificial pieces that are going to glide nice and smooth against each other. And that's what we're going to do with a total hip. So we're going to ream out that acetabulum, put a new piece in there, a new socket, and we're going to cut off the femoral head and put a new ball at the top of the femur that's going to fit into that new socket and glide nice and smoothly. But a total hip repair is kind of an extreme procedure, and if we can avoid it, we want to try to do that. So if there's a break in the femur at the top near the hip, we can often go in and put a nail through the middle of that bone and bring it back together and sort of fix that into place. 
Now on the femur at the end, you have the head of the femur. Then you have a little neck where it goes down and connects with the rest of the bone. And then you have this little knob that sort of sticks out of the top, sort of off to the side. This is called the trochanter. And using that as a landmark will define the names of different breaks that can happen around that area. So if you have a break right around the neck of the femur, that's going to be a neck break. If the break goes through the trochanter, that's going to be an intertrochanteric break. Or if it's below the trochanter, that's going to be a subtrochanteric break. And again, most of these breaks are all going to be a little bit different, so we're going to customize the nail system and the screw system to meet the needs of that particular patient. So the knees are a common area where a lot of surgeries are performed because a lot of stuff can go wrong in a knee. In this case, I'm showing a bucket handle tear. In this case, we have the meniscus, which is the cushioning, the cartilage that fits between the two bones. In this case, it's going to tear, but tear around in sort of a circle, like a bucket handle has that little curve to it. That's where the name comes from. So in this case, we want to go in and suture that back together and bring that torn meniscus back together and allow it to heal. So an ACL tear is a common tear that you hear about, especially in sports injuries. So let's describe exactly what's going on here. The knee itself is made up of four primary ligaments. And there are a bunch of other little ones around, but there are four primary ones that really sort of hold the knee together. On the outside of the knee, you have collateral ligaments. So you have a collateral ligament on one side, you have a collateral ligament on the other side, and they hold the femur at the top down to the tibia or the fibula down at the bottom. So they link those two together. And the names of these are based on the directional. Remember your directional terms. The medial collateral ligament, that's going to be on the medial or the middle inside side. And the lateral collateral ligament, I know a lot of laterals in there. The lateral collateral ligament is going to be on the fibula side. It's going to be on the outside edge of the knee. And those are shortened to MCL, medial collateral ligament, and LCL, lateral collateral ligament. And then in the middle of the knee, we have the ACL and PCL. These ligaments are the anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament. Again, your directional terms, anterior meaning in front, posterior meaning behind. And cruciate, well, that means cross. So when we're talking about these cruciate ligaments, they cross each other. So why do these ligaments cross each other? Well, they do that because it adds stability to the knee. Now think of it this way. If you know architecture, take a look at some of the buildings, especially some of the big tall towers or maybe a bridge or something like that. You have the girders that go up and down and you got the girders that go back and forth. But then there's always some beams that go at a diagonal. And what that does is it keeps it from tilting one way or the other so that the bridge doesn't sort of collapse on itself or the building doesn't sort of collapse down on itself. It keeps it from pulling one way or the other. It adds stability to that structure. Well, these cruciate ligaments do exactly the same thing. They add that stability, that cross beam stability to the knee. And in this case, they're using the ligaments to do that. So cruciate means cross or crossing. And again, you have the anterior, the one in the front, and the posterior, the one in the back. And a common injury is for the ACL and many of these other ligaments as well, but especially the ACL, to tear. And again, if a ligament tears completely, you're not going to be able to pull it back together and bring it back together and let it heal. Now, in this case, because it's such a big, tough ligament and because the space that we're working in is so small, there's really not a whole lot of room to get in there and try to suture one to the other. There's just not enough tissue to suture into. So what we're going to have to do is go in there and replace the ligament entirely. And that means we have to make a whole new ligament. Now, we don't want to use usually an artificial ligament or, you know, a donated ligament because there can be some rejection issues with the immune system. So we want to try to use the patient's own ligaments if we can. And sometimes we'll harvest or graft some ligaments from other parts of the body. We can use the patella ligament, a little piece of that, or maybe the hamstring tendons. We can use some of that. And then because all of these are going to be small and the ACL is a really big ligament, we're actually going to bind several of them together and sort of suture them all together to make this one big ligament in there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to drill a hole through this side of the femur and this side of the tibia, and we're going to use this cool little jig, which lets the doctor know exactly when he's going in on this side, exactly where that drill bit's going to come out on the other side of the bone. So we can line it up exactly perfectly. That's what this little jig does. 
And then once you've got the two holes drilled, you're going to run the ligament through the two holes and anchor it on the outside of each of those bones. So it runs from the outside anchor point all the way through across the joint, through the other bone, and to the outside of that bone where it's again anchored into place. So you're making this really big ligament that runs all the way through both sides of the bone, and that's an ACL repair. But maybe it's not the ligaments that have broken, maybe it's the meniscus, the little cartilage that sort of cushions between the two bones in the knee, and that can break down. And if that happens, you get something called arthritis. Now, arthritis, arthro, we're talking about joints. Itis means sort of a painful, so we're talking about a painful joint. In this case, we have the bone starts to rub against other bone, and if that happens, that can, be, can become very painful, and we want to go in there and we want to repair that. And often, when it comes to knees, that means a total knee repair. These are one of the bigger procedures that you're probably going to be involved in and because it involves a lot of cutting of different bones and a lot of different pieces that then have to fit together. So you can see we're going to cut the femur, the end of the femur, into this geometric pattern. We're going to cut the top of the tibia off in this nice smooth pattern here. And these cuts have to be exactly precise because we're going to take some prostheses that are pre-made and we're going to fit it over the bone at this point. So it has to fit perfectly. So in order to make these very precise cuts, we're usually going to use a little jig, this little piece of metal that we're going to put onto the bone temporarily that's going to guide our blade as we make those cuts. And we can make them at all these different angles, especially around the femur, the end of the femur. We're going to cut a bunch of different angles to that. And then we're going to fit the prosthesis over that newly cut femur. We're going to do the same thing to the tibia down at the bottom, and we're also going to do the same thing to the back of the patella. We're actually going to take the patella and cut the back off at a nice smooth line and put a prosthesis there as well so that when all these three bones move together, they're all three going to be artificial and slide nice and smoothly over each other. And here you can see a setup for a total knee. Again, there's a whole lot going on here. You usually have a lot of people involved, you got a whole lot of instruments, and of course, many, many trays. Now, the interesting thing about this is that you have all these trays, but you're usually only going to use one element out of each tray. For example, the prosthesis that's going to go on the end of the tibia, that can come in many different sizes. So you'll have a whole tray containing all the different sizes, and you're only going to pick one of these to use it. But you have to sterilize the entire tray because you're often not quite sure exactly what size you're going to use beforehand. Sometimes we need to remove all or part of an extremity, and this would be known as an amputation. Sometimes what can happen is the blood flow can be cut off, or there can be an infection or something that can cause the distal end of the extremity to die off a little bit. So we're going to try to contain or limit the spread of that infection or that wound by cutting it off and then sealing the skin back over that wound. And when we're talking about leg amputations, that can be done either above the knee through the femur or below the knee through the tibia and fibula. So those are shortened as AKA, above the knee amputation, and BKA, below the knee amputation. And to do this, usually the doctor is going to dissect through the skin and through the muscle down to the bone itself, exposing the bone. And then they have a couple of different ways of cutting through the bone. They can use sort of a bone saw, an electric or powered one that's going to saw through that bone. Or they can use something called a giggly saw, which is kind of interesting. It's a little like a chain, like in a chainsaw. And it's got these rough sort of sharp edges to it this, along this wire. And you grab both ends of it. You hook it to two handles and you rub it back and forth. And as you do, you're pulling those sharp points against that bone, slowly slicing through the bone and cutting it off. Moving down to the foot, if there's a break or other problem in the tarsal bones, in the ankle of the bone, we can do something called a triple arthrodesis, which is where we're going to take the three main tarsals, the three main bones of the ankle, and fuse them together. So in arthrodesis, we're taking two bones, or three bones in this case, and we're going to fuse them together so they don't move against each other anymore. They're just going to be fused into one unit. And here you can see we've used a bunch of different screws at different angles to fuse those bones together so they don't bend and move against each other anymore. That's a triple arthrodesis. An Achilles tendon repair, this is again one of those larger tendons that we have in the body. Just like the ACL, which was this very large ligament, the Achilles tendon is a very large tendon where you have to do sort of the same thing. We have to bring it back together and repair it. Now, 
In this case, because it's on sort of the outside of the bone, it's not sort of stuck inside of a joint, it's on the outside, and it's nice and long, usually we have a lot more tendon to work with that we can suture into. So in this case, instead of replacing the whole tendon, we're going to suture into the existing tendon, suture all the way up one side, all the way down the other side, and bring those two pieces of the tendon back together with the suture holding it into place until the body's able to heal it on its own. And here you can see the very special suturing pattern that's often used in order to make sure we really grab hold of that tendon real tight and hold it into place because we don't want any more tearing to go on in that tendon. A bunionectomy, again, ectomy is removal of something. In this case, we're removing a bunion. Now, a bunion is a buildup of additional bony material along the outside joints of each side of the foot. Usually, the big toe is where you'll most often find a bunion. In this case, the bone has grown and grown and grown larger than it otherwise should. That's because of the rubbing and things like that can cause the bone to grow a little bit more. And what happens is as that bone grows, it tends to push the toe itself inward because it's growing and pushing outward and it pushes the toe itself inward so the toe is going to bend inward a little bit and cause a painful and sort of discomfort for the patient. So we can go in there and actually cut the bunion right off and once we do it's no longer pushing that toe in we can bring it back over and sometimes we'll cut the ligament on this side to release it a little bit and line that toe back up into a more natural position. So that's a preview of many of the procedures you're going to see during orthopedic surgery. Again, I hope this has helped you get an idea of what you're going to be going into. But I strongly recommend you watch a video or several of shoulder procedures, especially before you go to your clinical site so you have a good idea of what's going on during those procedures.